tonight is the opening of our wine tasting room. Three years ago, we outgrew our previous winery and moved to this building here in Henderson Valley in West Auckland. Welcome to our tasting room. There's a lot more to it than misty vineyards and cold wine on the deck. It's about hard work, perseverance, passion and patience. Thank you to everyone and uh, good on you. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh. I was trying again. to get off the box before it collapsed. But... Winemaking has a long and varied history in New Zealand. Many hard-working Dalmatian settlers immigrated to West Auckland throughout the early stages of the last century. Some planted orchards, others planted vineyards and started commercially viable wineries. It is their legacy that has played a great part in the current New Zealand wine industry. Hi there, I'm Shane Cox and I'm going to show you how we turn these two little sticks into this glass of wine. Great varieties, wine style, technology and scale can differ widely throughout the world. However, our story is similar to that of many thousands of producers out there and it goes a little something like this. To begin at the beginning, we'll start by going to visit my good mate and all-round clever guy, Rex, at his nursery. So this is a rootstock block. Here we have rootstock that evolved in America. It's resistant to a bug that uh, lives in the soil called phylloxera. It's absolutely essential to use rootstock in grafted grapevine production and wine production. This is what goes in the ground, and on top of this we graft the variety, we call it the scion, the variety that eventually makes the glass of wine that you drink. This is our block of budwood that we use for grafting. Everything here has been tested for the critical virus in the industry, which is leaf roll 3 virus. So it's all 100% clean and certified true to type. This is a stick of rootstock, and here we've got a stick of what we call budwood or cyanwood. What we're looking at is the process of taking these two sticks from this point here to this finished vine ready for the market here. We wax for two reasons. One is to protect the healing callus union, so you get this, the healing of, of the, the wound um, and the formation of the graft. The second is the wax stabilises that graft union. They're packed in the callusing box very carefully with separation to go into the callusing room. Which is kept at um, a maximum of 28 degrees, a minimum of 24. Uh, these have been in here for about 14-15 uh, days. They're likely to come out uh, by about day 18. Um, so if I pull out a graft, um, and I'll be able to show you uh, how it looks once it starts to callus. But if we have a quick look here, you'll see that we've got what we call callus tissue developing beautifully. The whole graft union has this uh, beautiful scar tissue developing around it, and that's what um, enables that graft to heal. And um, it's also starting to callus, develop the scar tissue on the base, and from here we'll develop roots. Each clone has its own unique characteristics, whether it be bunch size or flavour profile, and, and each one may have its own unique uses. So for example, if you look at Clone 6 Chardonnay, it's very typically used for uh, production of uh, Metho Champenois. Clone 95 and Clone 15 Chardonnays are very typically used for the production of quality table wines. So, in the last 20 years, there's been a tremendous amount of grapes planted in New Zealand. Uh, there are grapes at the very top in Kaitaia, in the north, upper North Island, right down to um, central Otago in the lower South Island. We receive grapes from vineyards all over the country, and we work with good people that manage these blocks for us. My job is to keep an eye on the local fruit that's coming our way. These vines have been in the ground for about three years. Typically, Grape vines give their first crop in the first three to four years, 
it may take a couple of extra years for the vineyard to come into final balance. Depending on the climate, a vineyard may last 20 to 30 years. Pruning is done in the winter months when the vine is dormant. We're out at Orotea, um, we're always pruning the red block. This is essentially the start of the growing season for us. The vines are, are dormant, we're just coming out at the other end of autumn. The soil temperature is below 10 degrees, and what that means is that we don't have sap and nutrients flying around in the vine. The leaves have dropped off, the uh, vines are sleeping. These are reasonably young vines, but uh, what we're doing here is what we call cane pruning, and so really we're just removing 80% of the growth from the previous year. And every one of these bud sites is where a new green shoot will throw up and there'll be grapes coming off here in, uh, in a few months' time. Bud burst here. These shoots are very fragile. They're prone to strong winds and growers are also very uh, anxious at this time of the year regarding spring frosts. Um, a heavy frost here would, would just decimate all these young buds and this is obviously what the, uh, the new growth is going to be for the coming season which is going to give us our grapes. There's just a little bit come away here. They just started flowering basically, only just. This probably isn't even 5% underway at the moment but you can just see it's just starting to kick off but there's some bunches which haven't started at all as the flower is pollinated the cap will drop and underneath is a baby grape these would have been right down here at the beginning of the season as the buds have shot away you just simply lift the wire up and contain it in here so once the shoots have gotten to the height of the post uh, we'll come along with a trimmer and Chop all the tips off and side trim as well. Ooh, what a beautiful day it is today. Noticed some big changes since we we're out here last. Primarily, we've actually uh, got some grapes now. The fruit set's looking pretty good. The bunches are well formed. We've got a, a high percentage of, of well formed large grapes. There's been leaf plucking to remove the leaves away from the fruit to increase uh, air circulation and exposure to the sun. I've been in the wine industry for 20 years and started here eight years ago with just seven barrels. All that time ago we were underfinanced and under-resourced and we still are to some degree. That first harvest, I think they made just a few barrels in a, in a friend's garage and um, I met Shane shortly after that and three weeks after meeting him, he flew off to Italy to do a harvest which was pre-planned. So he was away for three months and when he came back, um, he moved straight in with me, which I didn't realise was happening, but he, um, that was it and we've just kept moving ahead on that journey ever since then. It was the generosity of the Peshaw family that gave us our start. The business has now grown to the point where I need a larger facility. This building has quite a history. It was once a juice factory, a chocolate factory, and even a film studio. We're moving our entire operation into this new building, and in six weeks time, we will start crushing grapes and making wine here. on how to set up a winery. Best we pop out now and see how the fruit's coming along. Grapevines provide one crop per year. This is generally between March and May, depending on the variety. The raison is the onset of ripening. It's a lot easier to see in red grapes. They start out green, as you know, they turn red. That looks like the colour change is pretty complete. And from here on out, it will just be a matter of accumulating sugar. You'll notice there are bunches on the vine that haven't changed completely. 
So this is when we do our, our crop thinning. There will be guys in the vineyard that will just start at the ends of the rows and just go through the whole block, just selecting the prime bunches and making sure everything's nicely positioned and removing green fruit or vines that are excessively laden with too much fruit. Where bunches are crowded together, we also remove those as well. This allows good uh, air circulation, light penetration, and it just basically prevents crowding. Imagine where that is sitting, it's easy for it to get humid and moist behind here. It would be the first place that um, disease would start because it doesn't dry out very easily. Sugars are made in the leaf. Grapes that have no leaves don't get ripe. Now we've run through the flowering of, of grape berries. Notice these guys here are really green and they're a smaller, this is what we call second set. It's a small bunch that is flowered like later on after the, the, main, uh, the main crop has, has come away. That will still go red like this, but it will be well, well behind in maturity. Um, the danger is that because it looks red on harvest day, it could end up going into the bins and they're very immature, um, tannin wise, they're, they're very high acid, low sugar. All that can go out of there, it's just not going to catch up with the rest of it. So if I, if I look at this vine here, I would say that's probably a tad on the heavy side but basically not too bad. You've got uh, two bunches per, per, t per cane here and it's, it's nice and open and you've just got your fruit sitting like that. We wait to go on that. <laughs> but these will be coming in in the middle of April, so we've got another six weeks of ripening. So that's bird peck. The, the bird just pecks under the berry and takes the seed and leaves it all open. So a few things can happen is uh, disease can move into the site or wasps will come and get into it. They can, um, we spend a lot of money um, netting and protecting birds of the enemy of the uh, of vineyard grape grower basically. And we better get out of here because it looks like we're about to get run over. Waxlaw is a tiny bird, man, and they'll just get in. You can't, can't do anything about them. You know, they can't sort of. Normally, we lift the ends of the nets and sort of chase chase birds out. They'll, no matter how secure your netting is, you'll always get the odd one in there. And it's not the end of the world, but they they tend to sort of come in sort of packs, really, or flock, isn't it, for birds? But they'll really bloody they'll stick it to you. That's for sure. Bastards. Well, sugar ripeness is a consideration with red wine. Tannin maturity is, is really the key. Um, and we achieve that in New Zealand by having a long hang time on the vine. This fruit appears to be in really sound condition. Uh, there's no mildew rot right on track, it's looking fantastic. Notice we're getting just like a little bit of shriveling, a little bit of raisining, it's all just part of the vine maturation process. That's literally just turning up into a raisin. The water's evaporating out of the berry and that will just be extra sweet. You just have a concentration of sugar there with less water. Things we look at for red wine with our harvesting decisions is the lignification of the stem here, the browning off, see the, the actual stem of the bunch is the same colour as the cane now. Green equals green in red wine. You've got green stems, green seeds, you'll make green wine. So what we're looking for is brown seeds like that. If they're green, they'll impart green tannins. If they're brown, you get nice rich complex tannins. We look for the general stability and strength of the skin. As the fruit ripens, the skins will get tougher and they'll have better flavours. As of a few weeks ago, each red variety was starting to show its, its varietal characteristic. So when I taste this, 
we're starting to see that sort of uh, buoyant, Syrah, spicy, peppery sort of characters that um, is, is unique to the variety and you'll taste plum when you go down to Merlot and so on with other varieties. We're rapidly approaching harvest time. Now this is the time of the year where the grape grower and the winemaker have two very distinct opinions. The grape grower looking at this, he wants it picked. He's sick of worrying about birds and weather and all that sort of thing. Whereas the winemaker, we don't own the fruit, we're prepared to hang it out and take the risk. So there's always the grape grower, pick, 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 and we're just saying hang, hang, hang. So it's a time on a dispute. We'll take a quick berry sample from across the block. We randomly sample the block, take the berries back, squash them up and see what the numbers say for us. In the weeks prior to harvest, vineyards are regularly sampled for a few basic things. Firstly, bricks, which is the measure of natural sugars. Wine grapes contain around twice the amount of sugar as a normal table grape. And it just needs a couple of drops. It uses light refraction. Drop that on there. And just coming up for 22.8, nearly 23 bricks, which is a nice level of maturity. We measure the juice for the two key acids, which are tartaric and malic. The pH for wine is generally between three and four, and is a sweet spot for the beneficial yeast and bacteria used in winemaking. The nasty bugs that cause food poisoning can't survive at this low pH level, which is why excessive consumption is to blame for most wine-related illness. As grapes ripen, bricks increase, acid falls, and pH rises. These numbers are used to help predict a harvest date. Numbers aside, taste and aroma are the most important factors in our harvesting decisions. Aside from my own range of wines, um, our winery acts as a contract winemaking facility and we will be looking to take uh, fruit from at least four areas this uh, vintage, um, from Matakana north of Auckland, the Waikato, from the Hawke's Bay and from uh, Marlborough in Blenheim. The actual harvest will run for eight to ten weeks and uh, thankfully all these varieties don't ripen at once but once they do start it comes thick and fast. Behind me on the board here is uh, the dates and the crop estimations for each one of these parcels I mentioned. Now, crop estimation is not an exact science, it's exactly that, it's an estimation. The volumes can change and uh, the date that we select, well Mother Nature doesn't always give us that day either. So there's a lot of variance there, you have to have a, uh, a solid game plan, but at the end of the day it all has to fit into the winery, so it's quite a logistical exercise. Generally, white grape varieties ripen earlier than red ones and are first into the cellar. Now most of this fruit will come to us as, uh, as grapes, but we do get uh, particularly whites juiced, usually in the, in the region that they're harvested. We pay a processing winery to do the juicing for us and we receive the juice as either tankered or freighted up somehow to the winery here in Auckland for fermentation. At harvest time, things get a bit crazy. Actually winemakers get a bit crazy, but it's all for a good reason. This is our busiest time in the winery. It's a time of great effort and endurance. In the coming weeks, staff will work minimum 12 hour days, seven days a week. Ferments don't sleep. It's about grapes. It's about people. It's about the weather and anticipation. It's about fatigue and commitment. It's about passion and patience. This is what you call rarely ripe Chardonnay. The backs of the bunches are uh, yellow, there's a slightly green fleck to them, but basically golden. A little bit of sunburn here. These vines are carrying quite a light crop, which means they will ripen very readily. Also these small berries tend to be much riper than the big ones. This will be really, really sweet. That'll be sweet too, but 
they add a lot of extra sugar and flavor because all the flavor in grapes is held around the surface area of the skin on the inside you have a high skin to juice ratio inside there there's not much juice but it will be very flavorsome fruits looking excellent is what i would say awesome are pressed directly after picking. This can be whole bunches or de-steamed fruit. The pressing cycle takes two to three hours and starts off quite gently with a free run and lightly pressed juice running freely in the early stages. This is considered to be of a higher quality and may be kept separate from the pressing to the end of the cycle. Wine making 101, add sulfur dioxide, otherwise known as preservative 220. This simple chemical is widely used at low rates as an antioxidant and for its antimicrobial properties. People, it stops wine turning into vinegar. Sulfur dioxide is added to stop the juice fermenting and a pectinase enzyme is added to help clarify the juice. The juice is cooled in line on the way to the settling tank. As the juice becomes more difficult to extract, Pressure is gradually increased, held, and then released. The pressure is then reapplied and the process repeated until we get all the juice from the berry. At the end of the process, the skins are left completely dry. It takes one kilo of grapes to make one bottle of wine. So this is the tank that we pumped the pressed Chardonnay into last night. It takes between 12 and 36 hours for the juice to settle and clarify. After letting the juice settle overnight, it's ready for racking. It is at this stage that a winemaker can finally get a true reading of the quality of a juice. It is now that we would make any corrections to acidity or bricks. What we're going to do is a process called racking. This involves using a pump to suck the clear juice away from the sedimentary layer at the bottom of the tank. By using a light to shine through the hose, we can see we are only taking clear juice and no sediment. There you go, lovely clear juice. The juice is showing some browning. That's due to oxidation, which is uh, exactly what happens when you bite an apple and leave it sitting on the bench. The thing will brown. Because it's Chardonnay, we're not too concerned about that. Uh, basically, as this ferments as wine, that browning will drop out during fermentation. If you ferment juice of this clarity, you'll make quite fruit-driven wine. The explosive aromas and fruit focus of our New World wines has captured the attention of wine drinkers from around the globe. A lot of this has to do with keeping oxygen away from the juice or wine during the winemaking process to prevent oxidation and browning. To do this, we use an inert gas such as carbon dioxide or nitrogen. These gases form a blanket over the surface of the wine, keeping oxygen at bay. This is crucial in order to retain the delicate aromatics of a wine such as New Zealand's famous Sauvignon Blanc. This is still quite clear, and there's an inch or two of uh, clear juice before we get into the sedimentary layer. We're trying to make like a uh, Burgundian style Chardonnay, so we're actually going to carry some of that sedimentary layer across. The final juice that goes to barrel will be a lot more turbid than that. If you're working in a winery and your boss tells you to do a clear racking, you might carry on, but I'd keep it like that. If you want to uh, make a bit more complex and interesting wine, we'll keep going and take some of these bottoms across with us. You can see it's going quite cloudy now as we take the sediment across. Mm. Awesome. You keep going for a bit. We should barely get most of this across. 
So this, this layer, that, that's fruit pulp, and as you can see there's quite a lot of juice there. It's essentially 85% juice. In large wineries they keep all of the bottoms from all the tanks and then uh, filter it and recover the juice. So that's what we're left with. I'll just put it next to the other juice. Same juice, ferment this, you make fruity wine, ferment this, you make funky wine. Cultured yeasts have been propagated from famous wine regions around the world. Winemakers may select a different type of yeast for each different grape variety. These yeasts are chosen for their ability to tolerate cool temperatures and high alcohol during ferment. They also have a profound influence on aroma and mouthfeel to the finished wine. Add the yeast to the juice, give it a mix, then we're going to fill our barrels. Over harvest, we use a refrigerated cool store to help control the temperature of barrel fermented white wines. Carbon dioxide coming out of here. See it on the ground. Carbon dioxide's probably the most dangerous hazard in a winery. They're all quite hazardous places, but this is the one that will kill you outright. All white wines are fermented cool. The cooler the ferment, the fruitier the wine. Aromatic wines are often fermented between 12 and 16 degrees, with Chardonnay running a few degrees higher. This can take between two to four weeks. The warmer the ferment, the faster they go. All ferments in the cellar are sampled daily. The temperature and rate of fermentation is closely watched and controlled. The yeast have a big job ahead. If ferments are too cold, too hot, or lack nutrition, they become stressed and can produce an eggy, pongy odor known as hydrogen sulfide. This Rotorua type smell is generally temporary and easily fixed by adjusting the temperature or feeding them nitrogen based food. So there you have it. This is fermenting white wine. This is only a small tank, but it could be 50,000 or 100,000 litres. It's still going to look like this when it's in the tank. So, just to recap, the grapes, white grapes, when they come into the winery, first thing we do is press, we cool the juice, allow it to settle, rack the clear juice, and bring it off either to a tank to be fermented cool, or in the instance of Chardonnay, we'll put it into barrels and pop it into the container. The reds are starting to come in, so we're going to go now and have a look at how we, uh, how we make red wine. You can't seal up a lid when it's fermenting, otherwise it just goes bang. With no plan, I was happy without a plan, just wandering around, have it just bumming around. So this is a de-stemmer, um, it's kind of a smaller machine but even in the largest winery all fruit that, would, that comes in uh, generally would go through something like this. Uh, so this actually does takes the, the berries off the stem, this part of the machine, and we'll just have a quick look in there now. So we've been doing a bit of crushing so it's got a little bit of pinky acid stuff there. Basically. We drop bunches of grapes in here, as you'll see shortly. This cage is rotating. Now, it doesn't actually use centrifugal force to fling the grapes out, it kind of tumbles them. Now this is just rotating, and what we have at this end is this spindle here. So there's these beaters that are like on a, on a helix, and they're going in the opposite direction. So as the berry gets through, as the grapes go through, basically they just get tumbled off the stem the grapes fall through the middle of the machine and the stalks come out the end, as you'll see.
Yeah. Um, sort of quite a few of the berries are still quite intact. So you, you certainly need to be able to break the berry to get the juice to initiate the fermentation. But it's quite nice to have some, some whole berries in there as well. What happens is the um, you actually get a little fermentation going on inside the grape, which is um, tends to make quite a fruity component in the wine. After the red grapes are crushed, we would wait 24 hours and then add a selected yeast to the grapes and that will initiate fermentation. It's the last week of April. This is essentially what we call the peak of vintage. Uh, we've been crushing grapes for six weeks now. We've had white wine, red wine. Uh, the staff and I have been working pretty hard now with sort of pumping over reds, uh, clearing, um, making tank space by draining off the wine, pressing and creating new tanks for more fruit to come into. Uh, we've got about 10 parcels still sitting out there. Uh, my Syrah was picked yesterday, which is after about two weeks of really nice dry weather. Uh, there's been like a little bit of a shower overnight, so we're starting to um, get a few calls and people want to bring their fruit in. It's, um, yeah, it's time to sort of wrap it up. And uh, that really just ensures that all the, the raw material is into the winery. And from this point, even after all this hard work, this is actually when we start to make wine in, in earnest. It wasn't easy living in the winery. Our bedrooms were upstairs above the winery and I had to um, come down into the actual winery where our assistant winemaker was <laughs> you know, getting ready for the day every morning. He'd be here at sort of seven o'clock and I'd be coming down the stairs in my dressing gown to go through into the living space. It was always slightly awkward, um, but we got through, you know. Yesterday was a big day of uh, great reception, lots of crushing, and uh, last night was a fairly enthusiastic dinner party, but we're here this morning to have a look at what came in and uh, sort of how we're gonna deal with a few things. So today we're gonna make some of the pink stuff, rosé. Rosé comes from red grapes, and there's two ways of making it. Today we're going to de-stem the fruit and put it in the press. Uh, with the press we will get the juice uh, during the pressing process we will use an enzyme to help extract colour. It's in here cooling with enzymes to help it settle in exactly the same way that we would make a white uh, tank fermented wine. There's two ways you can get rosé juice. Firstly by pressing as you've seen Secondly, by what they call signe, which is, uh, comes from the French verb to bleed, and that means uh, basically just simply drawing off unfermented juice of crushed fruit. So this is exactly the same fruit as we pressed uh, yesterday afternoon. We're going to make red wine with the contents of here, but typically we should be able to uh, draw off, probably get a few grapes and what have you, but... There's nothing stopping us from taking that juice and putting it to a settling tank and making rosé with it. Obviously we're not going to do it with a bucket. We'll set up a basin and a pump and draw off our juice and, and send it away for settling. Looking pretty good. basic 
principles of red wine making are that all the, the colour, tannin, polyphenols, all the goodies are locked in close to the skin. So we need to exchange the volume of the juice over the cap once a day. There's different ways of, of going about this extraction process. Firstly, you have, uh, you've got plunging, which is what they'd use for Pinot Noir, which it's considered a sort of gentle way to extract. This is a very small tank, incidentally, but it's a good way to sort of demonstrate the basic concept. There's a limit to how big a tank you can plunge. They actually have pneumatic plungers for making Pinot, and they'd probably, you know, I guess, take up to sort of eight or 10 tons would be kind of the maximum. With plunging, the general uh, consensus is that we would do this between three and four times a day. There's a lot of energy, well, there's a lot of sugar in this tank, and you've got a lot of high population of yeast that are converting the sugar into ethanol, carbon dioxide, but also make heat. And uh, inside the cap, it's a bit like uh, if you ever put your hand in, in a lawn clipping compost, it gets very hot. The uh, fermentation temperature, I mean, a little tank like this, might run at 26 degrees or something, but in larger vessels, we actually cool the juice and just keep an eye on the temperature because it could easily soar to, you know, into the high 30s if, uh, if it wasn't maintained. If you work this way, you, you tend to make very fruity wine and it's in the absence of oxygen. I mean, there's air around it, but this is entirely saturated with carbon dioxide, so it's, the juice is not actually picking up any air. I guess I learned to make wine in New Zealand, but I've also worked quite a lot in Europe. I've certainly taken a shining to the way that they do things there, and uh, we try our best to emulate some of the tricks that I've learned over there. So that's your little plunge. Okay, so this is Syrah. It's one of my personal favourites. Uh, this is really smart fruit. But we're going to do uh, a bit of old school sort of winemaking really. I'm certainly not the only winemaker in New Zealand to do this, but um, more and more winemakers are starting to include air into their ferments and in their winemaking process, despite the fact that we've made a reputation for working in the absence of, of oxygen with our new world wines. So look at that colour, this is just beautiful. So the juice is probably about 20 degrees, so we won't worry about cooling or anything at this stage. And we're going to do what the French call a délestage, which is a rack and return. We're going to drain whatever juice we can get from the tank, pump it off to another holding vessel, aerate it on the way through, and then put it back over the top. As the ferment progresses, we'll start to extract tannin, and the, the colour will bind onto the tannin and become an integral part of the wine. At this stage, the, the ferment is more grape than wine, and we're just getting very um, sort of wonderful aroma of, of black fruits, and uh, they will actually diminish as the ferment goes on. It depends on what part of the country you come from. Um, every winemaker has, has a regional, you develop a regional palate. Like I can find some of the wines from warmer climates of New Zealand, but full and heavy and uh, be the fact that they are good wines and they would probably find my wines, I think they're elegant, they'd say they're lean. So you tend to get a preference for the wines that you make. You know, good and a bad thing, got to drink plenty of everything, I think. It's very important to note that this is just my way of doing things. I've tasted some awesome Syrah that's been made in a completely different fashion. Uh, just essentially just by plunging, without any pumping over, without any exposure to oxygen at all. And in fact, those winemakers work very hard to keep oxygen away from, from the wine. Um, and it just depends on the, on the style of wine that you're trying to make and your school of thought. So there's um, some legitimate other strategies, but uh, what I tend to find by aerating my ferments is uh, essentially you compromise or lose your primary fruit, which isn't a bad thing. I mean, I'd like to think my wines have a um, have a nice fruit component, 
but as a winemaker, I personally am trying to uh, not essentially make fruity wine. We, have, we as I say, have, have nice fruit, but it's the creation of secondary characters that make genuinely interesting wine, rather than just all up front, lovely aroma, fruity, tooty, what have you. So, but each for their own, I reckon. Wine out of the tank, we might as well check the temperature and density. I'm actually going to put a reducer on the end of the pump. We're going to work the cap uh, quite aggressively to start uh, before it gets a high level of alcohol in the wine. This is what we call pumping over. So we're literally pumping the wine over the cap. So that really just breaks the cap up. It just helps with that extraction from the skin. Even though we've just pumped wine over it, well, not quite fully back, but like in an hour, it'll be a solid pat on the skins again. Red wine, when it ferments, is quite warm. We must always cover, even this is what we call an open top tank, we always put a cover on it, otherwise the ethanol, the alcohol, will just evaporate straight out of the, uh, out of the ferment, and you could possibly lose between half and an entire percent of alcohol. So uh, we obviously don't want that. And you only have to use these blue tarps if some asshole steals all the lids off your uh, tanks and sells it as scrap metal. ferment takes about a week to go dry. With the sugars fermented, we are left with raw young tannins, acid and alcohol. These young wines can look surprisingly unfriendly at this stage. Deciding when to press depends on the variety and style of the wines we are trying to make. Soft, fruit-focused wines are less extracted and pressed shortly after fermentation. More complex wine styles can be achieved by leaving these young wines on the skins to soak for three to four weeks. This encourages the tannins to form long molecular chains that feel silky in the mouth. The wine will also pick up secondary aromas, which also adds to the overall complexity. Taste will be the ultimate factor in deciding when to press. The lighter body free run wine has less tannin and more fruit than the wine recovered from pressing the skins. This wine is often clean enough to go straight to barrel. When new barrels are filled for the first time, the oak influence is pretty dominant. This reduces by half every time it is refilled each season, and will only continue to impart its oaky goodness for the first three fills. Winemakers will have their own opinions about how much oak is too much. We can recover most of our juice by draining the tank, but there is often a few tons of skins to dig out. And there's only really one way to do it. What a beautiful day it is today. Fun times. The world is alive. See it turning in the light. And the sun is on fire. Hey!
sure why it is, but in all these sort of new TV shows and stuff, they always have a bit that's shot in the dark where you get in touch with your feelings and share them with the world. It's been, it's 10th of May, we've moved into the building. It's been basically 100 days since we took over the place, we've got it going, we've done vintage, we've finally stopped crushing fruit. I haven't had a day off in all that time. Uh, I've certainly done bigger and harder vintages, but 100 days, no time off, you know, you got to ask the question why you do it. It's good fun, I guess. After harvest, the pace does slow, but there is still plenty to be done in the winery. In this tank is the pressed wine from our big dig out the other day. The pump's out again to put it to barrel. So this red goop is, um, is red wine lees. So uh, we're, not, we're not too concerned if the pressed wine is, is, doesn't have to be crystal clear when it goes to barrel. You don't really want all that in there. So that's uh, it's basically yeast and fruit solids. The wine is gently warmed and inoculated with MLF bacteria. Malolactic fermentation, or MLF, is a natural way to deacidify wine. It is more a conversion than a fermentation and does not produce alcohol. But it does convert hard malic acid to softer lactic acid, commonly used in Chardonnay to impart a buttery aspect to the wine. Actually, all red wines need to undergo MLF in order to soften them. So this is what we call lees. After fermentation, the yeast die and settle at the bottom of the barrel. Regular lees stirring breaks down the dead yeast cells and adds complexity and mouthfeel and a mealy type flavour to the young wine. The entire industry of barrel making forests, it's not just wandering off with a chainsaw and coming back with a tree and going, here you go. The use of oak helps build structure into wine, enhances grape aromas and helps stabilise colour. The oak that's used in barrel making is selected from forests that are carefully regulated and maintained. Of the 50 species of oak tree, only a few are suitable for barrel making. Oak, grown in France and America, is the most commonly used. When a selected tree reaches maturity, typically at around 100 years old, it is felled and milled. The lumber is carefully graded and stacked in yards for two to three years to season. The wind, rain and sun gradually remove the sap and unwanted green characters from the wood. At the end of this rigorous selection process, only 20 to 25% of a tree is actually suitable for barrel making. Fires are used to heat the wood and to help bend the staves into shape. During this heating process, the staves are charred, adding a smoky, toasty aspect to the wine. This toasted character has found great favour with consumers and wine writers alike. Each barrel holds about 225 litres. That's about 300 bottles. French oak is slower growing and has a tighter grain, and imparts cedar and cigar box notes into the wine. The faster growing American species has a more open grain and gives a bold vanilla character. Now all this time and craft doesn't come cheaply. New French barrels can cost $1,700 and American $1,000. All of the leftover wood from barrel making is still pretty high quality, and a range of alternative oak products has emerged in the last decade or so. These slick new products include tank slats, oak beans and barrel inserts. It has an effect similar to barrel ageing, without the significant cost of barrels or labour. When used skillfully, these products have helped create plenty of award-winning wines. There are a few things to consider in preparing a white wine for bottling. The haze you can see is caused by proteins that are inherent in the grape juice. A natural clay, called bentonite, is added to prevent ugly deposits like this forming. The exact rate is determined by laboratory trials and is then added to the tank. Here goes the bentonite. 
It is at this stage we would also fine the wine if needed, using naturally derived products such as casein or isinglass. Even when added at low rates, they are fantastic at removing astringency and improving the mouthfeel and clarity of wine. Hard to imagine that's going to be in the bottle crystal clear in two weeks time. Once these products have done their job, they settle as a compact sediment at the bottom of the tank and do not remain in the wine. The wine is then cooled for a week or so to make the wine cold stable. The wine must be cold stable to prevent acid precipitation such as this. While these crystals are naturally occurring and completely harmless, they are unsightly and often mistaken for shards of glass. And nobody wants that. After 12 months in oak, it is time to prepare our wine for bottling. First we sample and grade each barrel. Assessing quality and looking for any dodgy barrels. The final blend may be made up from wines from different vineyard sites, varieties, a combination of free run and press wine, oak from different coopers and years, each with its own contribution to make. The more components available, the greater the complexity. Even a 5% addition from one component can have a profound effect on aroma or structure. Technically speaking, that may well be the final wine. We've only just taken a sample from each barrel. Um, it takes a little while for the, for the wine to meld, so um, we'll actually, before we create our final blends, we could leave this overnight and uh, always reassess. Once we've made our blend, we will check the sulphur and add our egg whites to find the wine. This will help remove any edgy tannins. See the wine's pretty clear. Wine's had uh, three or four rackings now, so should be very little if any sediment there. We use a paper cartridge like this. It has a rough side and a smooth side. The rough side catches the larger particles that are suspended in the wine. The smooth side, that's the minimum dimension that the wine will be filtered to. This is the wine going into the filter. Basically you could drink this straight out of the barrel. It's reasonably clear, there's no heavy sediment in it, but see when we compare it with the wine that's been filtered, the filtered wine just has a, a nice bright hue and a slightly better appearance. So there you have it. This is finished wine. When it's finished filtering, we'll be loading the tanker at 3 o'clock and it will be sent on its way over to the bottlers and there it will be bottled and packaged. so much sense that people come in and pay us money and then take the wine away <laughs> and it's great to to just have that experience and it's lovely interacting with our community more and talking with people and talking about what they like and don't like about the wine it was an adventure yeah, it, was, it was fun and um, I'd do it again. Yeah, I'd live in a winery again, I think. From here on out, it's up to the suits to get it out there. All the hard work is done and I'm just going to kick back with my mates. Without everyone here tonight, the wine wouldn't be here and neither would this film. We've turned sticks into wine, a film studio into a winery, and we're all here to enjoy it. Cheers. Cheers.
it's a, um, it's not, hang on, three. It's too four, all that shit was saying a deal wrong. I have to reshoot all that, Ben, sorry. You're not filming, are you? But, uh, you might get through it, mm. yeah. Drummer number one, he would drink. Sin, sorry, said he didn't know what he did. Pop shots, taking a knee. Cry, cry, baby, I'm a charity. I heard the song on the radio. It's my perception of the break of show. Hi there. Hi there. Hi there. Hi there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're a fat little girl. The. Go again. Uh, no, that's going to be all contradictory. 24 hours, didn't I? <laughs> oh, nice, man. That's so flattering. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, today we're going to talk about acid. Acid. Uh, <laughs> Go on, babe. Get into it. Urgh. I think it's a great label. I think it's a great label. <laughs> I think it's a great label. <laughs> Do you think you'll get that in? Turn it up. Bright lights and turn it up. Boogie. Hidden, but they were bottled up in the bag. 